All right. Hi, everybody. So today we are on page 94. We're starting on an Eden chapter. So a lot happened yesterday. So Eden raced his drone in the race under the alias Eli, Whit or Eli Whitman. Um, and so he pretended to be someone else so he could race. He was funded or sponsored by Pressa, who had taken money out specifically to do this because she wanted to get the money back in their winnings. And it apparently the money she took out was counterfeit. And so they were not happy with that when they found out and they demanded he withdraw from the race. And then all of a sudden this mysterious guy appears. And this mysterious guy comes and he offers to be his patron and sponsor him. And everyone seems to be scared of him and he's not talking. And it's kind of like, Ooh, like what's, what's happening. And so this guy says his name is Dominic. And he is interested in Eden because he really thinks that he has talent for the design. He thinks that he's going to win. So he's going to sponsor him for the finals, which is taking place the following evening. Um, Day meets up with June. So June comes to the Antarctica for a um, meeting with, so for, between the, um, elector and the president of Antarctica and they meet together to um, discuss funding because Andin is trying to completely redo the Republic and fix what was wrong with it, which is really cool. Um, but very expensive. I'm sure there's a lot of things that needs to get done. Um, and then we uh, see that the two of them are going to reunite in um, at the a banquet in a couple of days. They're going to be at a party together. So that's where we're at right now. So Eden is just coming off his big race victory and making this new acquaintance. All right, page 94. Eden. I toss restlessly in a series of nightmares. My mother getting shot over and over again. Me locked in a glass cylinder and a forever rocking car train. Train car, weeping and waiting for someone to let me out. The blurry haze that blankets my vision after the plague finishes with me. The man named Dominic steps out of that haze to talk to me. Drones zip by overhead as I run down strange streets, searching for a family that isn't there. It all swirls together into one long, endless dream. I wake in a panic, as I always do. I spend the rest of the night pacing in my room, scribbling down more engine ideas to distract myself until the first light of dawn appears. Mm -hmm. Then I head off to the university before Daniel's even awake. The final day of exams passes passes before me in a blur. I finish my tests early, even though I'm exhausted, and hurry into the school's halls as fast as I can in an attempt to avoid talking to anyone. The halls are still pretty quiet, but some of the other classes have already let out, and a steady stream of students are making their way down the halls and out of the university. I walk down the path alone. My shoes echo against the tiles. Simulated afternoon light from outside the city's bio biodome is streaming into the halls, painting everything in a gold. A few loud voices drift, me, drift to me from somewhere up ahead. I stiffen, slow my walk, and listen more closely. Damn, Emerson and his crew. He's laughing his head off at something that Jenna has said. And from the sound of it, they're, heading out to the, they're he hanging out at the end of the hall, blocking the entrance of the university. I stop in the middle of the sunbathed hall and try to figure out another way to leave the campus. On a normal afternoon, there would be two other entrances and exits in this building. But because of today's finals, I know the back entrance is already locked. I think about trying the side entrance to see if it's open, but it doesn't connect the elevators that lead back down to my floor. I'd have to take a long meandering route down to the mid floors in order to get back home. Maybe I'll be lucky today. It's the last day and he must be in a good mood, too busy celebrating with his friends to notice me slipping out of the university. I hesitate, hesitate there for a moment too long. In that instant, I hear his voice suddenly turn in my direction, followed by a shout that echoes down the hall. Well, he shouts, looks like the wing boy's out early, as always. My palms break out into a cold sweat. Emerson chuckles, same sound I always hear whenever he's thought up some new way to mess with me. I curse under my breath, then whirl around and start walking toward the side entrance. But I can hear him catching up, along with the laughter of his friends. My eyes dart to the timer, floating in the corner of the virtual view, of my virtual view. Other students won't get out for another 15 minutes. 
I'm only halfway down the hall before an arm grabs the back of my shirt and forces me to turn around. Emerson's cheery brown eyes are staring straight at me. He grins. What are you in such a hurry for, Wing? He says. My eyes dart to the two behind him. Jenna and Alan smile back at me. It's the last day you'll ever have to deal with them, I tell myself over and over again. Just get through this. So I shrug out of his grasp and mutter, I'm late to meet up with my brother. Alan grunts in surprise. I thought you and your brother weren't talking much these days, he says. Doesn't he have another brother? Jenna pipes up. Emerson's face lights up. He did, but I think he died in front of a firing squad. He shakes his head at me in mock sympathy. I remember seeing a leaked video of that online. John. I still in Emerson's grip. My heart freezes. Emerson senses my tension and knows he's in a nerve because the edges of his lips tilt a little in grim satisfaction. I've never seen the video of John's death before, but I've read enough descriptions of it in the news to visualize it. It happened in a prison courtyard with high stone walls and a dirt floor smeared with dark stains. Republic soldiers dragged in a struggling figure and chained him in place against one of the walls. John's execution, when he had taken Daniel's place so that Daniel could escape. I can't breathe. The world around me, their laughter, the footsteps of hundreds of students, sounds muffled. I don't say a word. Emerson, Allen, and Jenna are all staring at me, daring me to look away from them. Poor thing, Jenna says, her voice dripping with just a little too much sympathy to be genuine. Are you okay? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to bring him up. The level system doesn't penalize them for talking about my oldest brother. The tech still can't tell the difference between a, heart, a hard heart and a bleeding one. John. I'm standing in front of my brother's bo broken body, and I'm delirious on a gurney as the Republic drags me away, and I'm calling for my mother as a soldier lifts her, his rifle to her head. The anxiety crowds my mind and swells to the surface. The way John would walk with me to school, the way he stayed up struggling to read by candlelight. Emerson leans so close that his nose almost touches mine. It's okay, Sky Boy, he says, just loud enough so that the others can hear. He pats my shoulder. Why don't you let it out? You can cry. One second, his face is an inch from mine. The next, he's on the ground. My fist is smeared with blood from his broken nose. The students around us scream, some in delight. Fight, the word ripples through the hall. And suddenly people are pressed in a tight circle around us. In my view, a red warning flickers, followed by instigating a fight, minus 50 points. I couldn't care less. I swing down again. Emerson is so surprised by my attack that I managed to catch him on, on the chin again. Then his weight is overwhelming me, and he shoves me off hard enough to send me skidding across the ground. Still, he doesn't attack. He doesn't want the level system catching him fighting back. Skyboy's grown a pair, eh? He says instead, his voice sharp. I struggle to my feet. My hands scrape raw against the ground. Look at you, attacking someone unprovoked. I scramble to my feet and swing blindly for him again. Then people are prying us apart, and someone is shouting something in my ear. Hey, it's okay. It's okay. Voice belongs to Pressa. She's still in her janitor uniform, and her hands are on my shoulders, shaking me. She looks up at the crowd around us. What the hell are all you gawking at anyway? Don't you have places to go? The heat of the fires, the heat of the fight's over, and the crowd's already losing interest. As they scatter, Emerson dusts his shirt off and gives me a grim smile. So this is going to be how we part ways forever. Pressa helps me to my feet. Are you out of your mind attacking someone like those guys on the last day of uni? You're going to get more point deductions, you know, if his parents file charges and the court agrees with them. But the memory of what happened to John is burned too deeply into my thoughts for me to care. I swing my bag back over my shoulder and start walking toward the exit again. What does it matter anyway, I mutter. The system's rigged from the start. Pressa doesn't argue with that. She sighs and rests her hand on my arm. You don't have to explain it to me, she says, her gaze distant. Someday, we're all going to get out of here. Find adventure and happiness somewhere else. In gratitude, I touch her, her hand in return. At least there's one person in my life who seems to understand. And of course, she's from the Undercity. You sure you still want to go to the drone race finals? She says as we step out of the university's double doors. Maybe tonight's not the best night for you to head down to the Undercity. Take some time to cool off, you know? The cooling off is the last thing I want to do. I'm always the one cooling off, shaking free. The thought of John's execution plays over and over again. I have to go. I need to go. If I don't, my mind will burst. No, I reply. 
I'll be there. Daniel. My heart's still hammering from my evening with June by the time I step out of the elevators and into the streets of the Undercity. My lips still burn from our kiss. A million thoughts run through my mind, and I find myself cursing silently at everything I did. What a gaudy idiot I am. Why didn't I just tell her exactly how I felt? What kept me stopping me in the moment? So what if she doesn't feel the same way? Am I such a coward that I'd rather not know? I sigh, indulging in my bad mood as I shove my hands in my pockets and hurry through the grungy streets. If I let myself... I could almost pretend that I'm back walking through Lake at night. Maybe nothing's changed at all since June and I first got together all those years ago. By the time I arrive on the scene in the darkest district of the Undercity, there must be at least half a dozen AIS drone vehicles blocking the intersection, their flashing lights painting the buildings in alternating washes of red and yellow, adding to the mess of colors from the neon signs hanging overhead. Justin and Lara are already here, and when they spot me, they wave me over with grim faces. Some distance away, I see Min Garen, the AIS director, talking in low voices with some of the police. She and I exchange a brief look of greeting. What took you so long? Justin asked me as I approached them. You in the middle of a date or something? I glare at her as we walk. Yeah, my, my only my first kiss in 10 years with a girl I'm crazy about. Something like that, I mutter back. What happened here? You'll see. Lara interjects from my other side. The street is crowded with curious onlookers, and police and AIS agents alike keep telling people to get back behind the barricade. The pockmarked street is littered with broken glass, and burn marks against the sidewalks and the walls tell me that there was some kind of explosion here. Already, the name hangs unspoken in the air. I can see it in the tense faces of my fellow agents, the way they're talking, the way they're taking extra precautions. This is Dominic Hahn's work. Then we reach the crime scene, and I halt in my steps. In the middle of the intersection, lies a body, laid out so purposefully that there's no question this was intentional. It's been sliced open. The face is unrecognizable. Beside me, Justin and Lara look away from the vicious wounds that lace the corpse. They look on, my heart beating rapidly. An ugly flashback emerges from the dark corners of my mind now. The memory of bodies piled next to me as I woke up among them, terrified and in pain. The memory is so vivid that I barely register men coming over to stand behind us. Her lips are folded into a grim line as she studies the body with us. It's him, yeah? I say to her in the beat of silence that follows. He did this. Min nods toward the telltale red handkerchief tied to the corpse's ankle. And he wanted us to know it, she replies. The kind of cruelty that Dominic Hahn inflicts on his victims is so sharply reminiscent of what the Republic used to do, like Commander Jameson used to do, that I feel an ominous weight on my chest. This isn't just the work of a sadistic criminal. This is manipulation, someone trying to send a message, someone threatening the city with his, with his power. Who was he, I ask, and as I bend down beside the body, do we know yet? Clara nods, a councilman in the president's inner circle. This stops me cold, the president's inner circle. My eyes go back to the mutilated figure before us. Most of Han's past attacks have been against people who couldn't repay his debts. But an act like this is bold beyond belief. Had this councilman owed him money too? It's possible. This isn't a regular citizen. He had bodyguards, all kinds of security attached to his account. If Han was able to do this to a prominent councilman in a coordinated attack, then he's not only growing more confident, he's got more connections in powerful places than I thought. How did it happen? I ask. Jessen runs me through what they already know that the councilman had gone missing earlier today, that he'd been driven here and jumped at the intersection still alive, then that he had then been set on fire. I wince at each graphic detail. My attention goes briefly to people sitting on the curbs now, being interrogated by the police, probably nearby store owners, some who might have witnessed everything happening. And they still managed to get away? I ask when Justin finishes. She shrugs, and Lara nods at the scorched walls. They seem like they struck fast and hard, it's not their first time in this game. It's just the worst one yet. I run a hand through my hair in frustration. But what does Han want? I mutter to no one in particular. Money? Revenge? Do we have any evidence? What does he get out of killing a councilman? Aside from all the AIS descending on him like a horde of wasps. No idea. But there was a theft tonight in the East City Laboratories, where a rare energy coil was stolen. 
No confirmation yet on whether or not these two events are related in any way, but the timing is unusual enough that it's worth noting. My eyes go back to the pitiful remains. We're going to be the ones to deliver the news to the family. Min is looking at me with a thoughtful expression. She turns to Jessen and Lara, then gives them a terse nod. I need you two to gather some more eyewitness accounts, she says. Go on, let me have a word with Daniel. They don't hesitate. As they head off, Min turns to me and lowers her voice. I know that look, Wayne, she said quietly. It's going through your head. But this all looks familiar, I reply. My eyes still settled on the body. The wounds? I shake my head. The political escalation. Up until now, Han has stayed in his realm, punishing anyone who fails to pay their debts to him or to lose a gamble or part of some rival gang, but this is different. And cross my arms. He's prepping the people. What do you mean? I give her a hard look. If there was ever a time to bring the topic up to her again, it's now. You know how I feel about the city's level system. I remember what it's like to be part of the lower class when we're pushed to our limits. At that, Min makes an exasperated sigh. Daniel, you know my answer to this argument already. Then don't ask for my opinion, I say. But I'm warning you, Han isn't a fool. He knows that the number of poor down here is growing, that more people aren't able to raise their levels and can't afford to feed their families. You've got flattened levelers setting up entire rows of tents down here. Han knows that. He's already instilled a proper amount of fear in the Undercity. People here are intimidated by him. But he also shows them enough mercy to make them love him. Now he's attacking city council, prominent politicians. I point at the body. Not a coincidence that Han decided to put his body on display down here instead of hanging it up at the sky floors where they live. He knows how much the people down here hate the sky floor politicians. He wants the people down here to see, to know who's really running their city. Min gives me a skeptical look. You're insinuating that Han wants to stage a coup? She asks incredulously. incredulously. I'm saying that it's a real possibility, I argue back. Min shakes her head in frustration. Han doesn't have that kind of power. You're telling me that he's going to try seizing the capital of the most advanced nation in the world? A nation that's still too young, I argue back, that can topple just like anything else. She wraps her temples in irritation. Give me something I can work with. I'll never be able to convince the council that this is even a remote threat. Her expression makes me want to scream. These cracked Antarcticans have never lived through a revolution before. Their country is barely a few decades old. They have no idea how fragile this entire system is. Everything always seems like it's going fine until suddenly, one day, it's not. All of you think this place is un invincible, I snap. You don't see the poison bubbling under the surface. It's been here since day one. What do you propose we do then? Find a way to Han's side. We've had no luck hunting him because our relations with the Undercity are so poor. And how are we going to do that when we don't know the first thing about him? I smile grimly. I've got some insight into how a notorious criminal can be caught by someone on the inside. She did it by becoming someone I could trust. But you need to tell the president that the system is unsustainable. We're setting the Undercity up for a revolution, and I don't even think they're wrong to do it. Min still looks unconvinced. She shakes her head. The president's not going to like me bringing up this conversation again, she says. You know how much he supports the level system. These sky floor bastards always try to maintain order by giving themselves all the advantages. Eden's words linger in my mind, along with his disgust at my working for the AIS. Sometimes I think you've forgotten where you come from. But I was never the same as someone like Dominic Hahn. Hahn is a killer. You don't have to talk the president into taking it down, I reply. Just tell him how much his own life is at risk. Han isn't going to stop at killing a councilman. President Akari is the prize at the top. And if he wants to stay alive, he needs to do something to quell this. Min's eyes have gone cold again, but she doesn't dismiss my words. Instead, she nods at me. Go join the others to gather eyewitness accounts, she says. We'll talk again later. She doesn't wait for me to respond before walking away with her hands in her pockets. Justin comes up to me as I watch the director go. I think we're narrowing down where the drone race's final is happening, she says to me, sending me a virtual map of the Undercity. Yeah, I answer. Yeah, it might be the same place as the semifinal. We've pinpointed a few scattered crowds idling on the sides of the streets. Looks like they're waiting around for drones to pass through. Then it's happening very soon, she nods. It's too hard to track the drones since they move so fast. You can only rely on the gathered crowds. Once those spectators catch on that they're being watched, they're going to scatter in a second. I force myself to turn away from the crime scene. 
Show me where the crowds have been spotted. As I start to follow Justin away from the crime scene, I bring up my directory of names and instinctively pick out Eden's account to send him a message. But he's offline again. The tracker on his system disabled. Barely a day since our argument, since he almost got a knife to the stomach down in the Undercity. And he's already at it again. Off to do hell knows what. I sigh. What do I have to do to force him to stay put? Tie him down to a chair? Maybe he's back home, I tell myself. We're out celebrating, as he should be. Today has been his last day of classes, after all. And he could be out with his friends, laughing his head off in some sky floor bar. If I track his location and find him again, he'll know. And that won't get me anywhere with getting him to open up. I take a deep breath and try to ignore the nagging feeling in my gut. But all that swirls around my mind are memories of the days when Eden was lost to me. When the Republic had taken him somewhere and I had no idea where he was. All I remember is seeing him stumble forward through the ash and fog of war from the hospital. And me scooping him into my arms. <laughs> Screw this. I give in to my worries and then tap the icon for Eden's location. My AIS privileges let me bypass permissions so I can track him without his consent. A small loading icon swirls in the center of my vision as my system traces him. Ahead of me, Justin pauses to bring up a virtual map between us. See, she says, you can notice hints of drone spectators crowded along these locations. And much, not much evidence to go off of, but it might, puts the rough estimate of where the race is happening tonight right here. She points to a spot on the virtual map. At the same time, my system finishes tracking where Eaton is. His location dot appears, bright red, almost, almost the over almost the exact spot where Justin is pointing. I blink, then frown and shake my head. Hang on a sec, I mutter, reloading the geolocator. I think my system glitched. Show me where the race is on the map again? Justin brings it up again, while Eden's location also refreshes. This time, there's no mistaking what I'm seeing. A sudden wave of dizziness sweeps over me. Eden is exactly where Justin's finger is pointing. He's down here in the Undercity, and he's at the drone race. Eden. The semifinals of the drone race may have been crowded, but that was nothing compared to tonight. People squeeze into the already tight plaza until it's fit to burst. Those who live in the dilapidated apartments surrounding the square watch from their windows. Some of them look like they've charged money for other spectators to come watch from their balconies because there are packs of people dangling off the sides of the stair ledges, their legs swinging. Shouts fill the air. Apparently, word is spread and through the underground circles that a last minute entry surprised everyone and won the first heat last night. Now, I crane my neck, looking for the crowds for any sign of my new patron. Beside me, Presta keeps my drone tucked securely under her arm and pushes us through the throngs. She impatiently brushes strands of her blonde wig from her face as she goes. Hey, move out of the way, she snaps at the two large gamblers blocking her path. You want to bet on last night's champion or not? Then let him through so he can set up. Barely five feet tall, and yet the people move aside for her, letting her cut a swath through the crowds. I admire the way she throws her shoulders back, and I'm grateful to follow in her wake. In the center of the square, the virtual display hovering over the space now shows both a countdown clock to the race and a list of tonight's contestants. Half of the racers have already gathered on the line. I notice a few glances in my direction, but this time, the racers look wary. When I meet their gazes, their eyes dart away. An uneasy, an uneasy, an uneasy feeling churns in the back of my mind. There's something about this man who became my patron that has reverberated through this space. In some ways, he reminds me of Daniel. He has a natural born charisma. I think about how he seemed to recognize me in a way that most others never have. And his interest in my drone's engine? Cressa nudges me, jolting me out of my thoughts. She nods toward the crowd. There he is, she murmurs. His presence is undeniable. The crowd parts without question for him as he makes his way down to the plaza's clearing. Unlike many down here, He's dressed in a crisp, almost harsh attire, whites and grays underneath a long black coat. Premature silver peppers his hair and stubble. He seems imper impervious to all the commotion around him and indifferent to those walk watching him walk. When he sees me, though, he quickens his steps. Good to see you here, Eli, he says to me, resorting to my false name. His eyes dart to Pressa, who still has my drone under his arm, under her arm. And all ready to go. Almost, I reply. What happens tonight if we win? If we win, you get a pot 10 times larger than the one from last night. 
Dominic smiles. That's why we're all here, isn't it? And if we don't, Russ asks. The man doesn't sound concerned. If you don't, I'll stay your patron, he glances at me. There's promise in that engine you built. We can do a lot with it, but beyond entering into illegal races like this. I think you're destined for more. Destined for more. I can't help but feel that same sense of pride welling up in me again. Daniel spends his days worrying about worrying more about whether or not I'm alive than what I've been working on. The other students in my university couldn't care less, but Dominic's words make me stand a little straighter. Sounds like a plan to me, I say to him. Dominic glances up at the virtual countdown hovering above us. We have five minutes to go. Then you better get to it, he says to me. And before I can ask him anything else, he turns his back to me and steps toward the crowd. Here and there, I notice guards in suits watching him, paying attention to his every move. It's an unsettling contrast to the easy way he talks to me. Then they're calling my name to the line, and I return my focus to the race. Press's arms are folded tightly over her chest and every muscle in her body is pulled taut. She steps closer to me, as if to give me a good luck hug, but stops short, so we just idle there, with a narrow sliver of space separating us. Somehow, I get the sense that she also thinks there's more to winning this race than meets the eye. But for now, that's my job. And if we win, Pressa's father can get all the medication he'll need for the rest of his life. Pressa nods at me. Good luck, she says, flashing me a brief grin. Not that you need it. I don't know why I feel compelled in this moment. Maybe it's the flush of her cheeks or the fear pumping through my veins at the thought of losing this race. But I suddenly lean in toward her when she doesn't back away, give her a light kiss on the cheek. I'll do my best, I say. It's amusing to see a look of surprise on her face for the first time. Her eyes are bright and wide. Then she smiles and shoves me toward the racer lineup. Yeah, you better, she calls over her shoulder as she heads back into the crowd. I watch her go until I can't distinguish her from the mass of onlookers. The red lights overhead flash again. Everything in the space tenses. I turn my view onto the channel that will follow the track of this race, then brace myself in the line and turn my eyes, and turn my eyes to the starting path. Then the starting sound goes off. My drone flies out of my hand to hurtle forward, nearly lost in the blur of others. Cheers explode from the audience. I tune out the mystery of my patron. I tune out what Pressa might be thinking about me or where she is in the crowd. I forget all about my brother. All I do is focus on the track. My engine now warmed up, moves faster than ever. It glows a fierce blue-white as it curves around the end of one alley, branching off from the, from the square, clipping past two other drones to take an early, easy lead before vanishing around the intersection. <laughs> from the stands come shouts of surprise, but unlike at the semifinals, there are no grumbles, no angry calls at me. It's almost as if Dominic has stopped anyone from wanting to antagonize me. Drones close in from behind me, seeking to knock me out or catch me off guard from both sides. And I'm too far ahead now. And they can't catch up. We hurtle through the narrow streets of the city, past one intersection, then another, through the food market, down an alley winding through a series of smoke spewing factories. This time, I'm better at steering my drone. It zips sideways through a small crack in a wall, narrowly staying on track while cutting short the, the race path by a hair. One drone manages to close in behind me. I veer my drone up, tricking it into following me, and then suddenly dive down toward a busy street of stalls, selling fabrics and pots. The last second, I pull my drone level again. But the one following me can't do it fast enough. Its wing catches the side of one of the stalls and goes careening out of control, smashing into the side of a building in a shower of sparks and metal. The people in the street let out startled cries. It's all I get to see before my drone leaves the scene to dart through the rest of the track. There are no other challengers that come close this time. My engine turns faster and faster, its glow intensifying. My heart feels like it's close to bursting. This is exactly how I envisioned it working. It's perfection. The entire race felt like a blur of seconds. Then I'm already hurtling back toward the square, leaving a trail of virtual neon blue on the race path behind me. My drone zooms back into the square, winning by a handy two lengths. The crowd explodes. I can feel hands slapping my shoulder hard. A ringing fills my ears as the plaza catches the fever of a hot race. Everyone is on their feet. Vaguely, I register Pressa as shoving me in excitement as my name appears at the top of the rankings again. The rush of the wind is so strong that I feel dizzy from the glow of it. I close my eyes, relishing the feeling, not wanting it to end. Everything is a haze around me. The roaring stands, the virtual numbers hovering in the center of the arena, shifting in real time as they declare me the winner. Then the red lights in the plaza flicker. The audience looks up, momentarily confused. They're supposed to flash only when the race begins and ends. Delayed reaction? 
but right as I think it, they flash again, then flicker out completely. I blink at the new low light. Everyone breaks into a buzz. Already, some people start making a beeline for the exits, as whispers lace through the crowd that the event's been compromised. The police are here. The guards are coming. Clear out. Somehow, my eye catches a movement that's all too familiar with me. The sight of a sh silhouette, sight high up on the, the sight of a silhouette high up against a wall, perched with perfect balance. I can see the figure against the massive circuit breaker board that I'd first seen situated at the entrance to the plaza. Even though I can't make out anything but his outline, I recognize him immediately. My brother is here. Daniel. Usually when I'm in the Undercity, I'm doing a sweep with my fellow AAS agents. I've definitely shut down illegal gambling and drug operations and all sorts of other cracked businesses before, as well as closing down unauthorized makeshift elevator stations built out of old sewage tunnels. But tonight I'm alone, masked and hooded. I look like one of the hundreds of gamblers that roam this place. It's obvious that this side of the Undercity is the worst side. Rows and rows of tents line the walls along the narrow dark streets, and vendors stand outside forlorn empty shops watching me as I pass their storefronts. Here, in this outfit, I go back to my lake routine, hunched shoulders, listless gaze. I'm careful to keep a lookout for anything suspicious, while at the same time, not making eye contact with anyone. Seems to work okay. People think I belong down here, someone who's clearly used to walking rough streets, but it still puts me on edge. I didn't come to Antarctica just to return to living like a street orphan. What the hell is Eden doing down here again? The thought rings through my system like a warning bell. He's the smartest damn kid in this entire university. He's got an internship waiting for him back in the Republic. He's got friends. He's got everything he needs. Why is he here? Why can't I understand him? Why won't he talk to me? His location now takes me to a small, unremarkable bar. The bartender gives me a hostile look. This kind of place should be intimidating for most people, unused to being down here. But I've seen plenty worse than this. What's going on in there? Justin says over our line. I observe the bartender's posture than everything else in the space. My guess is we need a password to get through, the whisper. Can you scan the outline per outside perimeter for anything inside this, anything behind this building? Looking now, she says. I step out the bar and into one of the narrow side alleys. At first, it looks like any other dead end street, a narrow space packed with garbage bins and wads of trash strewn all over the place. When I walk closer to the back wall and run my hand along it, it feels thin and hollow. On the other side, I hear the sound of raucous cheers. There hadn't been a doorway to this bar, at least that I could see. There hadn't been a doorway to this in the bar, at least that I could see. This is some kind of shoddy makeshift wall, separating the main streets from a hidden space. I glance up to see where the back wall ends. It extends up maybe five or six floors, a crumbling brick surface bordered on either side by dilapidated apartments. A familiar sight to a runner. I sprint toward the wall, then skip up several steps to grab the second floor ledge of the building next to the back wall. In a few seconds, I'm pulling myself up and jumping to grab a third floor's balcony railings. The exertion sends a familiar thrill through me. This is how I survived in the Republic. It takes just a moment for me to get to the top of the back wall. The cheers coming from the other side suddenly turn deafening. When I get my first glimpse over the wall, everything looks bathed in a hazy glow from the strings of red light bulbs. I find myself staring down at a clearing packed full of people. There must be at least a thousand people crammed into a space that's probably meant to fit half, less than half that number. They crowd around a small clearing in the center of the square, where a line of racers now stand with their drones. Eden's location, in my view, now flashes its signal he's very near. And sure enough, when I take a closer look at the racers, I see him. My familiar, his familiar blonde hair, his glasses, his wiry lean, lean frame. My brother's a drone racer. I lean against the wall in danger for a moment of losing my balance. Maybe I'm just making up what I saw. Maybe I'm so intent on finding Eden, I'm hallucinating. But when I take another look, it's unmistakable. It's him, along with his friend Pressa, who's in a long blonde wig and wearing a smug look of satisfaction. Not only was Eden in the race, but judging from the way everyone's gathering around him, he won. That's when I noticed the other man. He's standing before both Eden and Pressa, his face hauntingly recognizable from all the internal AIS reports I've seen. Dominic Hahn. I can't believe my eyes. Dominic Hahn has killed hundreds. He's committed some of the most gruesome murders I've ever seen. Some that make even the worst of the Republic's crimes pale in comparison. The image of the body on the streets is still fresh in my mind. 
I think of the sheer terror on the faces of the witnesses we were questioning. Even the act of hunting for him is considered dangerous. You don't want a man like this setting his sights on you. Dominic Hahn doesn't attend races like this. He rarely appears in public when he can just send his underlings in his place. He's one of the most elusive figures terrorizing the city. AIS has glimpsed him only a few times, with nothing but a grainy photo of his face to prove it. And yet here he is, standing in front of my brother, a thoughtful smile on his face. As I look on, Han says something to Eden that I can't make out. The blood in my veins chills to ice. I force myself to stay calm, blending into the shadows, while the audience below gapes at the exchange. Before him, Eden stays frozen, unsure of what to say in response. Walk away, I urge him silently. Turn your back, run. Except my brother doesn't. He smiles a little at Han and then says something to answer him. I feel like I'm back in the Republic again, looking on helplessly as the soldiers take my family away. Why is Han talking to him? What does he want with him? But even as the questions flood my mind, I know the answer by instinct. It's because Eden made the best drum here. His nimble hands have built a machine so remarkable that it caught Han's interest, that it beat out all the experienced racers, that it won. I've never doubted Eden's talents, but have I been, still been underestimating him? Everyone makes room for Dominic Han as he steers Eden back toward the center of the clearing. Hostile looks linger on my brother. If it weren't for Han's presence behind him right now, he might already have a knife in his back. A surge of panic hits me. I have to do something. My hand lingers by the gun at my belt. I'm not as good a shot as June, but I've got pretty good over the years with my over the years with my AIS training. From here, I might be able to take out Han with a single shot to the head. But Eden would be the most immediate suspect. A new kid suddenly here when Han's killed? I don't know how many of the people in this audience are Han's spies and bodyguards, but I do note that there are some whose eyes sweep the audience instead of focusing on the racers. If I managed to kill Han, his men would shoot Eden dead before the body even hit the floor. There's no guarantee I'd hit Han. What if I missed? I grit my teeth and force myself not to draw my gun. Instead, my gaze goes up to the red bulbs dangling over the space. I follow the trail of lights until they end next to the walls the sides of which are supported by a lattice of thick steel beams. An enormous circuit breaker sits against the wall that would have led back into that small bar. I straighten a little from my perch on the back wall. In the shadows, I know, I know I look a little more than a moving silhouette, and no one seems to notice me as I swing to the crisscrossing steel, supporting one of the side buildings, and pull myself soundlessly up onto the lowest horizontal beam, then the next one. I keep climbing until I reach the circuit breaker. The wires connecting all the ceiling's bulbs bunched together here in the upper corners. Aside from those bulbs, this clearing is lit only by the weak light coming from the surrounding building's apartments. I pull a knife out from my boot. Down below in the clearing, Han pats my brother on his shoulder. The sight's enough to send a shudder deep through my bones. I slash once through the red bulb's wires. The entire space plunges into darkness. No time to waste. I turn on my system's grids. In the chaos, a series of thin, neon-blue virtual lines light up over my view, showing me where to go and where people are. I swing down from the beams one at a time as fast as I can. My feet hit the ground in seconds. Then I'm bolting into the crowd, shoving past people as I seek out my brother. I reach him. In my grids, he looks like a sickly green animation. He lets out a startled shout before I clap a hand over his mouth. Then, without a word, I pull him with me and run. To my overwhelming relief, he doesn't resist. He just follows me. We dart through the crowds to one of the narrow alleys the other people are running toward, one that dead ends at the nondescript shop and leads out into a main street. Everyone around us jostles past, panicked that the clearing is being raided. Somewhere behind us are Dominic Hahn and his men, but I don't dare look back. You follow me down here, Eden snaps at me as we go. In the darkness, his eyes glitter once, livid. He doesn't have a clue how close he came to death. You don't understand, I say. That man was Dominic Hahn. At that, Eden blinks at me. So, he asks. So, I answer grimly, you have no idea what you've just gotten yourself into. And that's where we'll stop for today. So next time we're going to learn more about Dominic Khan. So we're doing good. We're like a third of the way through the book already, guys. So that's pretty exciting. Probably finish another two weeks. And we'll go from there. All right, so I will see you guys tomorrow, and we will continue with the reading. All right, bye.